dare great things for Christ. Christ calls us to dare great things. In the marketplace, as well as in the mission field, there has never been a time like the present for the spirit of the Catholic entrepreneur. Now is the time for men and women of great courage and great vision to engage our church and our culture. Now is the time to dare great things. And here is your host as we dare great things, Father Nathan Cromley, the president and founder of the St. John Institute. In our work with the Catholic business leader, one of the most sensitive subjects is whether or not they should make money. For some reason, making a profit in our business has been associated with guilt and corruption. But is this association always accurate? Is it okay for a Catholic business leader to actually make a profit? And if they do make a profit, what are they supposed to do with it? How does Christ qualify our success? And how does a profitable Christian business look different from those of the world? I want to thank you all for coming, for taking this time to actually ask the deep questions that are challenging for so many people in leadership, so many people who work in business especially, and to understand that the gospel has a response and is not quiet when it comes to the real questions that you face every day. And I just want to, first of all, salute you and thank you for facing them. <laughs> because what our world is a culture that seems to be thinking that success comes out of thin air and that somehow or other we're just entitled to a material prosperity that is guaranteed by someone else's labor or someone else's ideas. But this is simply not true. If we stop our innovation and stop our, our moving forward, our power of invention, and the support that we have for free economics of small business, we are going to implode as a community and as a culture because the material world does not sustain itself. In fact, you can't just conjure up the comforts that are necessary for the good life of education, of dialogue, of family peace and concord, of political civility. These things are, are, are able to subsist when a certain level of economic material success has been guaranteed. And the proof of that, of course, is the wonderful peace that we have been able to live in our own country. And we all know this. But if you take away that material success at the bottom, then the laws of survival of the human person come out full force once again. And while, of course, you can always find happiness wherever you are, it becomes a lot rarer. And this is why what you're doing as small business owners is so vital. And yet at the same time, so many people struggle with an obvious question. What do we do if we actually are successful? <laughs> and again, this is a great question, right? Because I mean, we do everything that we do in order to be successful in our business. And if you're successful in your business, your business will make a profit, right? We could just define the profit if you want in terms of technical business terms as a surplus of retained earnings over expenses, right? So if that's fancy talk, of course, what that means is that you bring in more money than you put out right? Retained earnings over expenses. And, and, and that, that, that formulation of profit can make us feel really guilty because it means that in the end, we're growing and we, our pockets, our books are growing. Our bank accounts are growing. Our quality of life itself is growing. And we can feel a little bit guilty, even a lot guilty. And that's probably a good thing, right? I mean, because we all know that as Christians, we need to take care of others. We know that we follow a Lord who died poor on the cross, right? He died without clothes. He died without possessions. He died without friends, you know, and here we are living really most of the time in luxury. And we know this because even if we might not be in the highest levels of American society, a wealthy American or even a successful American is wealthy by every other standard. And we can understand this and, and look around and say, is it okay that my life goes well? that my children are well-fed and well-clad and well-educated while well, I know that, in fact, other people aren't. And that it's not necessarily because I had a greater amount of merit. It might be. I mean, it's a lot of times you didn't get to where you were because you were dilly-dallying, right? But at the same time, we all know that we're, we've been blessed, 
right? We, we've been blessed and we're fortunate and, be, and we, be, we recognize that and it can make us say to ourselves, I wonder whether or not it's actually okay for me to live like this. And I think that that's a very healthy question. It shows that in fact, you're well aware of the needs of your fellow human being. And it shows also a very definite humility. Some of the most corrupt people in the world of business are those who never ask that question. Are those who say, nope, I'm entitled to everything that I can earn. And isn't it funny that the same spirit of entitlement that so often plagues the world of the have-nots can be found in the spirits of those who have. (laughs) Isn't that something? We can look around and say, no, and I'm entitled to everything that I earn. Yes, I mean, like you definitely have the right of private property. And yes, you definitely are entitled to what you earn. But that doesn't mean that it's good for you to have as much as you do. And that certainly doesn't mean that what you have in some way or other belongs to you exclusively. And that's the limit, the beautiful and wonderful limit that the church in, insists upon because it comes from the gospel itself. It comes from Christ himself who taught us that while it's okay to have money, it's never okay for money to have us, right? And that, that, that balance between having money, even having a lot of money, and the point where the money has us is a fine line and it's a deadly fall on either side. It's a deadly fall on the one side because poverty will, will come to those who stop working. We know this. It'll come to us because it's not a good thing to handicap six, the success of your children when you could, in fact, provide for it. Successful people providing for successful people make for successful people and around them. And we lift up the economy by being successful. It's totally fine. And in fact, I think it's necessary for us to invest in our children, in our families, to those who are around us to make them able to do what we have done. But on this, so if you fail there and you handicap that, well, of course, I mean, we all know it as, as like anything. You take a good leader out of a business and that business is going to fail. Is it really to anyone's benefit to see a business fail? I, I don't know, I, I can't, but it's hard to imagine a case where it's, the, it, where it's true, except if it's a bad business, which then is already a failure. But when a good business fails, it's a catastrophe. It's a catastrophe because it impacts negatively everything down the line, from the people consuming the goods that it produced well, to the people who worked there, to the economies that depended upon the economy of that business. It's a collapse that will have a ripple effect of negativity in our society. But on the other side of that crest line, there's also a difficult precipice. And that's that if I am successful, I I could in fact become too successful. And, And what is that line? That line is in the heart of the leader who is given those resources and given that prosperity and how you choose to deal with it, how you learn to deal with it. That's, and it's a crest walk. Just like everything else, you're walking on a crest line. And if you're in a mountain, for example, environment, you sometimes have to walk on what they call a razor ridge line. And these are not fun. Well, I mean, they're very fun in a sense, especially if you're crazy like me, then, then it's a lot of fun. But there's a high risk of falling. Yeah, the wind could come and gusts blow you over. You can feel like you're going to fall because sometimes literally it's a matter of feet on, uh, of security And on either side, it falls off precipitously so that most of the time to do this type of thing safely, you need to even be roped in, meaning that if you fell, you'd be able to be caught by the rope and the harness that you're wearing because it's just a really dangerous thing. But it's the line that connects one summit to the next. It's the line that's going to take you to where you need to go in those mountains. And so you need to walk it. And the leader is constantly walking a crest line. there's a balance point that those who are trying to succeed need to find. The balance of how much time you spend with family compared to work. The balance of how much risk you take in the workplace in order to generate the growth that you need. The famous chicken and the egg. It's really funny when you're an entrepreneur because you're like, I want to grow. And then everyone says, well, you can grow if you have money. You say, but I can't have money until I grow. And, and at that point, those who are less audacious sit back and say, well, I, I'm, I guess that that means that you really can't grow. <laughs> and, and those who are intent on success say, and here we go. We're going to take the risk. 
and, and the, the egg comes before the chicken, but then the chicken comes before the egg. It really doesn't matter in the end. We got to do what we got to do. And you push forward. Well, we end up doing that in so many aspects of our life. That entrepreneurial spirit that's at the, at the heart of small business ends up infecting every aspect of our life. And that's a good thing. Every leader has to take risk. Every leader has to walk that crest line in so many aspects of their life. Be it a mom at home with the kids. Talk about walking on crest lines. You have the highest, the highest risk possible in that the value of what you're giving for your kids is the most important thing out there. And you're walking there saying, is it, should I keep them at home and educate them or should I send them to the school, right? Should I teach them to stand up to the bully or should I tell them to go away and ignore them? Uh, should, should I, in fact, help them by pushing them to excel or should I work on their relationships? All that, it, it, I mean, even in a marriage, you're walking on the crest line. You're, you're look, if you're trying to hit a target, you have to aim, right? That's the same thing when it comes to making a profit in a business. In, in order to hit the target of being Christ's instrument in this world, you need to run a successful business, but you at the same, which means that you'll be successful. And at the same time, you need to be someone who knows what to do with that success to make others grow thereby. And that's the genius of the Catholic Church's teaching. Does your family matter? Join the St. John Leadership Network and receive a family mission infographic that will help you focus on your family. To learn more, go to www.stjohnleadershipnetwork.org slash member and join for free today. So here we are trying to understand how we can really be successful in business, which means therefore generating profit and at the same time be faithful to Christ. Well, there is a document that the Vatican put out in 2011 called The Vocation of the Business Leader. And it's an incredible document. It contains so much deep and true thinking for us of how to apply the Bible and the teachings of Christ effectively to your situation. And here I'm talking to you as Catholic business owners or the leaders of a business that's making money. <laughs> If you're making money and you're a Catholic, you probably feel guilty about it. <laughs> Somewhere inside, we say, I'm not sure that this should be happening. And that's, again, a good reflex. We remember what it says in 2 Timothy, the love of money is the root of all evil. We remember what it says in 2 Timothy, again, where he says to Timothy, man of God, have nothing to do with these things, right? So, And we can say, oh my goodness, and our Lord was poor, and Mary was poor, and Joseph was poor, and it seems like all the good guys are poor. And Well, first of all, let me just correct that. That's not the case. There are a lot of good guys who were not poor. Think of Joseph of Arimathea, for example, who gave Jesus Christ his tomb. I want to underline this. Although Christ did not own his own tomb, and you can emphasize the poverty of that, let's also remember he was laid in a hand-hewn stone tomb. <laughs> he, he, was, he wasn't buried in a ditch. He was buried in a tomb that was carved by hand out of stone. All right? and, and when Mary Magdalene, put the costly perfume on his feet, a perfume that valued the, an entire year's working wages. So I just, I put it in the modern context. When Judas says that, you know, could have, that's worth 300 denarii. What he's actually saying is that's an entire year's wealthy wages. So that perfume that she put on his feet would have cost by today's standard, what? $35,000, $40,000. It's incredible to think about what, when he says that that perfume costs 300 days wages, so go ahead and work for 300 days. Take that calculation and say, that's how much the perfume of Mary Magdalene cost. And Jesus let her anoint his feet. It doesn't mean that Christ was wealthy. And it doesn't, increase, it doesn't mean that Christ was saying that wealth is a fabulous thing that everyone can handle. But if you didn't have wealth of the wise men, Mary and Joseph wouldn't have been able to live in Egypt. They were given gold, frankincense and myrrh, and they did not deny the gift. Well, that gold came from somewhere. It came from business. You look at how King David funded all of his kingship. Well, he funded it thanks to the, the businesses that he, of his kingdom and the taxes that were levied and so forth. So it's just to help you to understand, like sometimes we have an opinion that is, that comes from a vision of scripture that's simply not scriptural. But in fact, there are wealthy people who are in heaven. 
It's just going on that line that I told you. It's okay to have money. It's not okay to let money have you. So let's go ahead and take a look at the document itself, right? So this is the document the Vatican put out, the vocation of the business leader. Turn to paragraphs 51 through 54. This is the fifth of the practical principles for business that the church enunciates. So it's really a wonderful document. It's not papal teaching. This is not magisterium of the church. It's a vatamecum, which is a Latin word meaning it's like a handbook that that does a nice and concise job of putting together Catholic thought in a, a cogent and attractive fashion. It's a dense document, which is good, like typical, but they make of this high point in the document of saying, here are six principles that if you follow these, you want to know what makes a good Catholic business leader follow these principles, right? So the first is that the business contributes to the common good by making goods, right? So you're supposed to actually produce quality things. You uh, have a solidarity with the poor in order to use your business to try to lift the poor up. You have a good and safe working environment and you allow people to give their talents. One, two, three, four principles. We come to the fifth, which says businesses model stewardship of the resources, whether capital, human, or environmental under their control. So obviously what we're looking at here is the question of stewardship. And that is, what did you do with the resources that you were given? Well, if we're business people, we kind of smile and we say, we took something and we made something better out of it, right? Or we took a little and we made a lot. And, and our business is us collaborating together to take the resources of our time, of our energy, of our talent, our education, that is the, the resources found in my workers, for example. And I take the resources of the material world that's there. And I put all of that together in the harmony of the genius of leadership so that all of that contribute to making something out of nothing, right? We started with water and we ended with wine, right? We started with a truck and a couple of fellas and we ended with cleaning an entire street of all the garbage and putting all the garbage into that truck and all that truck into a wonderful landfill that's designed perfectly so that the environment is impacted minimally. Oh my goodness, that's an incredible thing, right? So that, that stewardship of the resources, that's an amazing way to look at what you do. I remember one time standing with a fella who owns 2,000 some acres of hardwood trees and has a lumber yard and has a, a, a wood shop and a wonderfully generous fellow. And I asked him, hey, how, how many acres exactly do you own? And he smiled and he said, I don't own anything. And I, and I kind of like waited because I was like, well, I know you own things. I, you own all these trees. And he said, no, no, no. In fact, I'm the steward of whatever it was, 2,647 acres of hardwoods. And he was serious. The vision that he had for the resources he was given is that I'm their steward. Well, a steward makes them prosper. And so this is the challenge. How do you see what you're doing? Do you see it as something you're doing for yourself? Well, then probably you should feel guilty, <laughs> at least a little bit. But if you see it as something that you're doing as a service, well, then why wouldn't you be successful at it for the good of the others? Would you like your business to become a virtuous workplace? Would you like Father Nathan to come to an event in your town? Visit www.stjohnleadershipnetwork.org slash r-events and join for free today. So the Vatican document that came out to guide us as business leaders issues six practical principles for business. This is the document, the vocation of the business leader, paragraphs 51 to 54. So go ahead and turn to that with me, because when you do, let's read this. This first sentence just, it almost takes my breath away. It's so strong. And I want to emphasize this. This document is strong when it comes to making a profit. Listen to what it says. Entrepreneurs exercise their creativity to organize the talents and energies of labor and to assemble capital and other resources from the earth's abundance to produce goods and services. When this is done effectively, well-paying jobs are created. Profit is realized. The resulting wealth is shared with investors and everyone involved excels. 
Well, if that isn't just an incredible endorsement, right, of the whole business enterprise, I don't know what it is. It's amazing. He's, you take the resources from the earth's abundance and you produce goods or services. If you do it well, look what happens. Wealth is created, right? The church acknowledges, it says, the legitimate role of profit as an indicator that a business is functioning well. So it's not the only indicator, by the way. There's a lot of other things a business could do besides looking at the bottom line and how much profit is actually generated. But isn't it refreshing to hear the church clearly saying that the church acknowledges that there's a role in looking at profit to indicate a business's success? I think it's very refreshing because so many people out there making it seem as if somehow a business is not supposed to be profitable. But there's the church saying, no, in fact, your business is supposed to be, it's an indicator that the business is functioning well. It goes on, when a firm makes a profit, it generally means that the factors of production have been properly employed and corresponding human needs have been duly satisfied. And this is a huge tip of the hat to what you do every day. And why at the St. John Leadership Network, we are here to support you. Because when you do your job well, two amazing things happen. Number one, you have deployed the art and the skill of human intelligence to correctly manipulate the things of this earth or the things of the services rendered and, and the acts that need to be done in our human world. And you've rendered them successfully, making them better and the world better thereby. This is no small feat. <laughs> and then, but if you do it well and you do it as a good follower of Christ, you've also done it in a way that elevates the life of your workers. You've given them safety. You've given them cooperation. You've given them a place to thrive and give their talents. And you've harmonized personalities, diversities of backgrounds, all kinds of different competing ways of thought. And you've brought peace and concord to an environment that has generated things in, into perfection and into a better state. I mean, hats off to you. And I think it's wonderful to hear the Catholic Church saying just that. It goes on, a profitable business by creating wealth and promoting prosperity helps individuals excel and realize the common good of a society. What an endorsement, right? Wealth is not the problem. Wealth is actually a goal because if you can do well, you can in excel individually and as a society, you can actually share your goods effectively, right? If you don't have something to give, then you won't be able to give a hand up to anybody. That's basically what the summary of this statement is saying. And it's a powerful vision, right? And, but it goes on now. This is the key. So on the other side of that, you have this ringing endorsement of profit, but you're like, well, where's the catch? Here's the catch. It says, yet yeah, creating wealth is not restricted to financial profit alone. The very etymology of the word wealth reveals the broader notion of well-being the physical, mental, psychological, moral, and spiritual well-being of others. The economic value of wealth is inextricably linked to this wider notion of well-being. So it, you can't, it's just what I was saying at the beginning, right? You, in order for you to achieve certain heights of thought, certain uh, uh, relationships in depth, you need a certain amount of comfort, a certain amount of sustainability. And the higher that you go on the, the peak of the pyramid that you're building of your life, the bigger the base needs to be. You cannot achieve, usually, unless it's just a complete stroke of genius, the, the, the mastery of, of, the, of the depths of the human heart and, and the skill of virtue without having a certain degree of comfort and sustainability in your life. Now, this obviously is a certain degree. You can go too far and that's to be condemned. That's when, in fact, your, your money can corrupt you and your wealth can become a weight that keeps your spirit from soaring. Absolutely. But what the church is recognizing is just the common sense to say, hey, the well-being of your body, of your psyche, of your spirit and of your morality and even of your faith, hey, this is tied to a certain amount of of ability in terms of materiality. Now, what determines that certain amount? 
It varies from each person in each situation. It also varies in the mission that God's given you in your life. Some of you have to achieve things and degree in places and in ways that require a, a bigger amount of financial wherewithal. The whole secret is to stay poor in your heart. And how do you do that? Well, that's a whole different talk. But at the same time, what the church is saying is there is the need to not be idealistic and separate out the spirit from the body or the spiritual care for other people from the very fact that we need to have businesses generating income and making profit. Later on, the limit comes. I mean, in, in paragraph 53, it says, while profitability is an indicator of organizational health, it's neither the only one nor the most important one by which businesses should be judged. Very careful here. You know, profit is necessary to sustain a business. However, once profit becomes the exclusive focus, if it is produced by improper means and without the common good as its end, it risks destroying prosperity and creating poverty. Po profit is like food. An organism must eat, but that is not the overriding purpose of its existence. Profit is a good servant, but it makes a poor master. And there you have the other side. That in fact, while it's a necessary thing, it's not the only thing. Businesses can also be judged based upon how much good they do for others. Businesses can also be judged by the culture that they create that allows their employees to thrive at home. Businesses can be judged by many different measures. And profit is of course one of them and it's a valid one. But be very careful, O oh Christian business leader, that it not be the master and the goal of what you're doing. The goal of what we do is the betterment of the world and the betterment of our workers through the success that we have in the workplace. And we have to keep our eyes on it all the time. Dare great things for Christ. Share your feedback with Father Nathan. Send us an email at info at stjohninstitute.org. That's info at stjohninstitute.org. And don't forget to subscribe to premium video content to form, unite, and inspire you at Eagle Eye Pro on our website, eagleeyeministries.org. That's eagleeyeministries.org.